Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome to the APNIC first security session. Um, I hope everybody is doing well and keeping healthy. My name is Adli Wahid. I am the security specialist at APNIC and your moderator and MC for today's session. Now I'm very disappointed that we're not able to see all of you in person, especially to all our friends in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, but I'm happy that all of you are here today from wherever you are. And if you don't mind, maybe you can put in a chat box where you are uh, connecting from. Um, as you may know, as you may know, uh, we normally organize the first TC or the first technical colloquia uh, at all of our uh, APNA conferences. Uh, and it's basically a collaboration with uh, AP Third, First, and, and APNIC. And the idea is to get the security community to share some insights and, um, and their experience in dealing with security incidents so that we can all uh, improve our security together. Now, um, today we are very lucky to have six speakers from six different economies. And I will take you to different cities as we go and talk to uh, our speakers uh, for today. Now, before we begin, uh, let me uh, remind you of some house rules. Uh, the first one is uh, be aware that we have a code of conduct for all of our sessions, uh, and they are published on our uh, website and also available now as a link in our chat box. Uh, have a look at that if you, if you are not familiar with it. Uh, second of all, uh, we do welcome questions or feedback during the presentation or after the presentation. So you can either raise your hand, the, the virtual hand that is, uh, in the chat box somewhere there, uh, and we will um, uh, enable you to speak uh, uh, using audio uh, when the time comes. Or you can use the Q&A uh, box put the questions there and we'll get the questions. Uh, but uh, if we have a lot of questions and we don't have to cover all, uh, don't worry about that. We'll take the questions to the speakers and the speakers can uh, uh, interact or answer the questions directly to you uh, after the presentation. Um, if, you have it, or if you're facing technical difficulties during the uh, session, uh, feel free to uh, leave a note and we get one of the technical guys to, to help you. Now, the last thing I would like to remind you, if you don't mind, uh, you can share also the photo of you of being part of our session on Twitter or, or Facebook. Just don't forget hashtag APNIC50 uh, so that we can find you. So uh, that's all from me. Uh, and I think we are ready now to get started. Uh, our first presenter is a good friend of mine from Jakarta, uh, Charles Lim. Uh, he is from the Swiss German University and he'll be presenting on their HoneyNet threat sharing platform. So over to you, Charles. Okay, um, good morning here in Jakarta and good afternoon there in wherever you are, maybe also good evening wherever you are too. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, can I share my screen now? Yes, please. Okay, let me do it. Okay, is my voice and my slide clear? All good, loud and clear. Okay, okay, thank you very very much, Padli, for inviting me to speak in this uh, <clears throat> conference, uh, APNIC uh, 50 years. So allow me to introduce uh, me about uh, what I'm doing, yeah. Um, so I actually uh, teach in uh, Swiss German University. I'm the head of cybersecurity lab in uh, Swiss German University. Uh, but now converting to security operations center, uh, we will handle uh, a lot of the incident response uh, from the um, uh, so-called academy research. Yeah, so we'll be actually teaching and also helping uh, many students to practice uh, how to do incident response. And my research area, you, as you can see over there, I'm also head of the Indonesia Hanina project. Uh, so I will begin with a, a very interesting uh, research grant that uh, we received from ECF Asia, which is a foundation of APNIC uh, uh, in 2019. And uh, basically this uh, research grant is actually uh, a collaboration uh, between uh, Swiss German University, uh, Badan Cyber Sandi Negara, which is a cybersecurity agency in Indonesia and also Indonesia Hanene project. And so 
the goal of this project is basically to develop and implement uh, a HoneyNet uh, thread sharing platform. Uh, basically, we will collect and uh, store and additionally add con uh, contextual information so that these threads uh, that we collected from the honeypots can actually uh, be able to be shared to the public and also for the community interest. So uh, my agenda today is actually to share what is honeypots and also uh, what are the uh, thread maps that we have this, uh, actually developed and uh, what we are doing in the thread sharing platform that uh, we get a research grant from. And then also we will also talk about uh, what are some of the threads that we detected from the honeypots and also uh, share about the timeline that this uh, threat actor is actually campaigning their threads. And then we will talk about the research output. And uh, maybe if we have some time, maybe we can discuss uh, some question of yours too. Okay, so a very simple uh, information about what is honeypots. Basically, honeypot, as you probably already many know, uh, is a decoy system to lure attacker to interact with it. Uh, it emulates many popular services such as web, SMB, SSH, and many others. And uh, we usually place them together in many services so that uh, you know, uh, the attacker will not know exactly. Of course, sometimes they may know when they scan and hopefully we can um, detect what they are doing and actually learn from it. And then of course, anticipate in the future. So uh, this is basically the honeypot in the network. As you can see, uh, you can place them in the DMZ. Of course, you can also place them uh, outside your firewall and you can also place them in the internal networks, yeah, including Wi-Fi and such. So basically, you are trying to actually detect uh, many of the threats wherever uh, your network is and to get some sense of what the attacker is actually trying to do, whether externally or internally. Now, uh, this is a very simple way to view uh, how actually Honeypot works, yeah, basically, uh, the attackers usually they scan, you know, most of the uh, important services such as uh, you know uh, secure shell, tenet, uh, because they are the gateway to the uh, internet, right? So what we do is we actually uh, route them to another port, like uh, maybe you know two 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 two, uh, so that the uh, the administrator will be actually log into that ser uh, services but uh, we leave SSH open to the attacker to actually uh, scan or whatever they are doing and they try to get in, right? So uh, basically uh, we are trying to get whatever the attacker is doing and interact with our services. And remember the honeypot is a decoy system and it's actually emulated system. So they are not actually using the actual SSH, for example, uh, but they are actually using an emulation services. So what are we doing actually in Indonesia? Uh, we actually developed some, you know, over the time from 2012, we actually uh, already installed uh, quite a many, quite some honeypots uh, until 2017. And we developed uh, these uh, threat maps. And basically what we are doing is actually try to uh, provide the public actually the information uh, to get some idea yeah, for the public, uh, what are the attack coming from uh, where are the attack coming from and the live feeds, you know, where they are actually, uh, actually what, 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 what port and services they are actually, uh, you know, after. And then, you know, on the right, you can see this uh, malware that we are actually capturing over the time. And on the right, uh, on the center, you can see the map. And then also on the center, uh, you know, near the bottom, you can see the statistics. Uh, in the one month period, you can also click on the one year period. So this actually provides, um, we can call this as an early warning system, right? For the public to actually understand what is the cyber attack, actually what we are detecting from the honeypots. So um, what are we doing uh, in our, this uh, project with uh, uh, Greg funded from this ISIF? Uh, basically, you know, uh, it's great to have a platform uh, that we can actually display to the public. But the problem is uh, we have not shared, you know, the threats to the public yet. So what we are just sharing is just basically a statistics and basically a map, yeah. Uh, but in actuality, 
uh, we have not shared the detail of uh, what the actor is doing and what are the threats you know, they are actually doing and you know, the detail of these threats. So what we are doing actually in this project is actually we develop a so-called uh, honey thread sharing platform. And these are the architecture, as you can see. Uh, basically, this is actually, uh, you know, in the middle, you can see the uh, HP feed is actually collecting from all these honeypots. Uh, they are the protocols actually used to uh, collect all the honeypots. And we pull them and we parse them all this in a so-called honey net parser engine that we develop. And then after that, we push them to a data lake uh, whereby we actually enrich the data uh, so that we can actually uh, show them in the dashboard. Uh, at this point, we are using Kibana, uh, but we are actually migrating to Grafana so that uh, we can actually share them to the public also. Uh, and, you know, um, again, uh, the threat is not really uh, rich until we actually analyze them. And so we have a security analyst that actually uh, a volunteer and they add this uh, enrichment of data. So the threat actually but become much more uh, informative and become more intelligence, as you may, may, you may say so like that, right? And so once they, you know, they are enriched uh, and then verified, we are ready to send them to, uh, let's say, uh, platforms such as MISP uh, and we can share them around the world. And of course, we can share them to the public as well. So um, let's explore what actually uh, we are detecting in our honeypots and uh, the threats that we actually categorize. Uh, so here is this, uh, uh, in the beginning, we actually uh, put down two honeypots. Yeah? Uh, one is Kauri, which is actually uh, detecting uh, threats on the SSH. Uh, the other is Dionia. These are two common uh, honeypots that we are actually using. Uh, and you know, this Dionia actually detect quite some services such as HTTP, uh, FTP, uh, MySQL, uh, SMB, and many others. Uh, in general, you can see the green one is actually telling you that uh, their channels, you know, these channels actually uh, collected information that we actually uh, get from the honeypots. Uh, in the peer IP channel, we get the IP address. In the login, we get the uh, user ID and the password they try to get in. And uh, in the commands channel, we actually get the command that they actually uh, send to our honeypots. As you can see, they get some malicious uh, so-called shell script or activate this shell script to download more, um, uh, let's say, malicious uh, payloads, right? And uh, in the Dionia case, we have a peer IP detecting their uh, original IP. Uh, the connection is actually the URL they are sending and the payload, you know, these are the hashes. Uh, as you can, you can know that most of the payload, we usually define them by hashes, right? Because they don't actually have the names. Um, in the category, you can actually see that um, uh, most of this cowrie, uh, I took this cowrie because they are rich. Yeah, uh, we define them, uh, these are partial uh, categorize uh, threats, yeah? Uh, you can see they are profiling system. You know, these attackers try to profile our system. They want to know whether they are, you know, maybe uh, x86 or maybe they are uh, MIPS or maybe they are, uh, you know, other, uh, other architecture. Uh, and then, you know, they may be doing some persistence. Uh, they try to, uh, you know, maybe install some cron tabs jobs, you know, and maybe they, they are using some uh, tools to enumerate users. Yeah, and then maybe they will install some backdoor as well. And sometimes they also do uh, privilege modification. So there are a variety of these uh, activities that these attackers are doing. We categorize them so that uh, we can actually define what they are doing in our honeypots. So for example, uh, these are some of the examples that they are doing. Uh, maybe the attacker IP address is from 35 202, whatever. And then uh, the shell command they are sending is such uh, something like this. They go to a temporary, they will download something, and then they will change this uh, shell script, and then, you know, they will execute it, right? Uh, and then they are, you know, we detect the URL. We also get the payloads. And, you know, these are the credentials. These are some of the multiple instances that we see. You know, those are the passwords, user ID. 
they actually brute force when they tried uh, to log into our honeypots. And uh, we also map them into a metre attack technique. Yeah, for example, this, uh, if they actually change the directory, we actually map them to file directory discovery. Uh, if they actually execute something, uh, maybe we actually uh, uh, map them it into a command uh, interpreter uh, execution. Yeah? So all of these are uh, done with the categorization. Now, of course, at this moment, we are still doing it manually, but uh, very soon, once this is actually categorized in a more complete way, we can actually automate them and discover the patterns. And we can actually automate them later with some uh, machine learning, which uh, we are going to propose uh, in the third year. But uh, here we are actually proposing them, uh, categorize them first. So here is this uh, threat correlation that we get if we actually submit them to VirusTotal. Uh, we can see uh, where the IP is actually coming from. And we can also see uh, where are the threats actually coming to attack us and where are the possible threats uh, you know, in the chain, right? So these are very important threat correlation so we can actually see what's going on. Maybe those, some are actually threats. Those are maybe not malicious. So we can actually view them in a more uh, enriched way. So uh, we also share you know, this platform in a dashboard. But of course, uh, this dashboard is still uh, needs some uh, user ID and password. Uh, for example, uh, an example of like uh, six active honeypots, we can see there are millions of attacks uh, in, you know, in a very simple one week attack, yeah? very, uh, actually very active attack. Yeah? And actually we can see uh, where are the country of origin coming from, the malware types, and also the uh, basically uh, you know the categorize of malware from whether they are Trojan, whether they are uh, ransomware and such. And we also categorize this uh, threat category. Yeah, uh, you can see there are a lot of port scanning, uh, brute force, and of course there are a few payload delivery and many other uh, such as also SSH configuration and many others. Uh, others uh, pattern names such as this uh, for SSH for uh, unsuccessful login also quite uh, a lot, yeah? Uh, and sometimes they also send anti-command, they don't do anything. So um, what is interesting is in the few more slides to come, uh, where we analyze the campaign that the attacker is doing. And what is interesting is that uh, we found that, you know, uh, for example, this particular uh, pattern, uh, you know, the threat pattern is that they are actually very heavy attack patterns during this time period. And we can see there are 7,000 hits yeah, using this uh, specific you know, system profiling and persistent uh, pattern code that we actually categorize. So it's a very interesting how they actually uh, appear in our honeypots. Uh, for this particular pattern code, they only exist into you know, 10 to 13 May, 2020. So again, you know, the attacker may appear only a few period of time and then they disappear. Right? Uh, sometimes they may reappear, right? Um, for example, in this case, we can see that uh, they appear in May uh, for a short period of time and then they reappear in July. So uh, giving this uh, you know, campaigning time period, we can study how they interact with our system and what's changing, you know? Uh, Maybe they change the pattern. Maybe they still use the same pattern. So we can actually see what's going on. And so they give us a more insight to what the attacker is actually doing. So we can see also that the same track actor that attack on July, June, and May. And, but they are doing a different you know, way of actually attacking. But uh, some of the URL stay the same. You know? uh, so this gives us a very good insight to what they are doing actually in our honeypots. Okay, so um, this is just a research output, you know, as uh, academician, we like to publish them, of course, uh, what we found, uh, you know, the threat category. And uh, if you want to join our conference uh, in uh, 28 and 29 uh, September this year, uh, we're going to speak on a very detailed threat category. Uh, since uh, 
we don't have enough time for this conference. I just show you a few threat categories and also uh, the threat campaign timeline. So again, we would like to thank uh, ISIF, uh, ISIF Asia uh, for their research grant. And we want to present this so that uh, this is uh, you know, known to the public. And uh, also um, it's good for all of us to learn what the attacker is doing in our infrastructure. So with this, I open up the question if there's any for question and answer. And back to you, Pa Adli. All right, thank you, Charles. That was an interesting presentation. Of course, I'm biased because at APNIC, we run the APNIC Community Hainet Project. Uh, but yes, uh, very interesting. We already have some questions for you from Manoj. Manoj has actually five questions. Uh, okay. So you can pick any or you can answer all. The first one is, is Honey, HoneyNet open source and can it be installed on a VM? Number two, if yes, what is the minimum hardware requirements? Three, having a honeypot right inside the network and not in the DMZ means we have to open certain ports. How does this work? Uh, four, is honeypot same like antivirus? Uh, and number five, does honeypot complement ISO 27001, ISMS? So maybe you can summarize your response to this. And uh, Manoj, wow. if you want more, you can reach out to Charles directly. Go ahead, okay. Pat Charles. Okay, yeah. thank you, Padli. Uh, that's a lot of questions, but uh, we try to <laughs> summarize it. Yes, uh, Honeypot is actually uh, basically uh, open source. Uh, you can download them from the internet, from GitHub. And we also put them into GitHub in a Docker. Uh, we can put them in a VM, you can put it in a Docker, but uh, we put it in a Docker so that it's easy actually to be transported anywhere. Uh, yes, you can also put it into DMZ. And uh, the way if you put it in a DMZ, you have to port forwarding into this, uh, you configure a firewall to be port forwarded uh, into these uh, honeypots. And of course, yes, uh, since honeypot is actually an emulated services, and if you install into this, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, in, in your open source uh, operating system such as uh, Linux, you can, of course, uh, you need to actually harden in, but um, you know, we can actually make it a very minimum yeah, services. And, and uh, basically they are actually emulated service, meaning that uh, they don't actually uh, you know, get access to our real SSH service or any other service. They are basically emulated service. If they are compromised, they are just an emulated service. So um, yes, of course, um, you know, this uh, emulated service is uh, basically you know, uh, a services that we try to, uh, to study what this attacker is actually doing. And you know, uh, this is just uh, a services that we put you know, among the services that you want to detect. Now, of course, um, this device is not maybe you can say classified as uh, ISO 27001 because they are actually put there for our learning uh, of what the attacker actually behavior out there in the infrastructure. So I hope this summarize uh, the questions that actually post it. And I'm, I'm glad that if you want to ask further questions, you can email me. I, I left the email to Pa Adli and you can contact me, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Charles. Uh, we have more questions, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Uh, but Jahangir, thank you for asking. We'll take up your question separately. Uh, but now from Jakarta, we are going to move to Dhaka. Uh, and Dabashi is, is waiting for us there. He is from the BGD EGOV CERT, which is the national CERT for Bangladesh. And today he will be sharing about common threat detection with traffic analysis. And Dabashi, if you're ready, then uh, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm ready. It's uh, okay. Yep, all good. Slide more. Oh, you can switch. Yep. All right. uh, 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 good afternoon, everybody. I am Jabashish uh, uh, Pal from the Information Security Specialist and uh, from Bangladesh. I work in BGD EGOP SART. The, our website is the SART.gov.bd. For this virtual session, I like to thank you, Epini 50 and our big brother Adliwari to give opportunity to show this presentation. 
actually uh, before starting our slides uh, there is some introduction that in here what we show these all the case studies actually are collected from by bgd gopsar from various source and intentionally the ip address or the domain related to our economy is blur and uh, in this presentation we are not interested to discuss about the specific technology vendor or any product implementation rather than we are interested to show uh, how to uh, capture how to uh, think uh, what is the bad uh, network traffic what is the good network traffic or malware traffic using the packet uh, capture analysis so uh, before starting what is that uh, uh, where we collect this type of cases actually in from bgd egopsart we put cyber sensor what, what we call actually cyber sensor to some critical information infrastructures so actually this this is the common uh, scale, uh, scale, just uh, This is just a common architecture of uh, this sensor. In here, there is one is hub module. That is what is called that CSMM. That is the cyber sensor management module. And another is the spoke module, where we actually put this cyber sensor and collect traffic uh, for analyzing. This is called the node, or this is known as a CSNM. That is meant network module route. Uh, this, in that tent, we what to put. actually we are interested to traffic what is the inside traffic to go to outside so we put our uh, infrastructure uh, in organization in here for example this is called the internet router then there is uh, one uh, link between their internet router and their uh, network we put our system in this position this is the academically this is known as the dmz position actually and this is the totally passive we are not doing any interaction on the traffic rather than we only sniff or check let's go the case one by one this is the main thing is coming so let's check this uh, this is that response of the user query and this is the response from the server response the thing is that it says nothing but a, uh, if you we already uh, familiar with the wireshark capture if we wireshark capture we uh, check the tcp dump or you to be uh, dump uh, stream then we will get this type of flow what we this we all we already collected from the various event and we uh, integrated this in a readable format so let's think about this uh, cases this is that um, case name is the detect active intrusion with possible vulnerability the thing is that from the beginning if we check this is the long query which is asked by the uh, user from the browser and the system response is 200 that means it's okay but if we check the query in very carefully in here we found that exec <coughs> execution command exec and who am i that all we know that who am i is a kind of uh, linux command where that uh, identified that what is the user privilege level and in that uh, in intrusion cases most of the time when attacker or hacker try to get the system shell first he usually check his id that means his privilege who am i and if we check carefully this who am i responded by the system is 200 that means okay and that is the zero it means that who am i response with zero zero in linux system is that highest privilege which is root id then i go for the next event in that case we will find that there is that some sort of linux curl command which is downloaded some sort of mal traffic in shell scripted in temporary directory and the system command is 500 redirection but it already get and executed so now the question is that how this thing actually the thing is that this system was vulnerable for the apache slor cbe 20190192 vulnerability why because we got the proof of concept code in the github and in github python script the first thing is that first command when the python script is executed and system is vulnerable 
then first command is that who am I and the response will be the come. So by analyzing the network traffic, sometime we can get that, that intrusion traffic and also possible root causes. Now come to the vulnerability uh, next uh, case studies. In this case, if we go, go for the first cases, then we found that the HTTP traffic that category was that HTTP gate. Now this case is that HTTP post. And if we check that post, then post is vendor PHP unit in something is like that. And in that case, there is one shell script is executed, duplicated Q and some short of scale, and it will be the reality. If the shell script is writing uh, executed by the system, then system responded to the user is 200 and is already duplicated to Q P shell and which is that prone good. This is the vulnerability of the PHP unit before that. Uh, and this is a method that, that uh, uh, PHP unit before version 4.8.28. This is exactly take that remote command execution and able to attacker to execute command into the system. If we go for that, that uh, case studies three, in this case, we will found that uh, post and sometime using the traffic analysis, we will get that uh, active backdoor. What is active backdoor? What is actually active backdoor? That means that when user, when an intruder or attacker compromise a system, he maintains some of persistence communication. He will not do his recon, initialization, scanning and everything and exploit again. Rather than after exploitation, he put a, a shell, which is uh, if, uh, if this is system shell, then he can hide this shell into some process. Or if this is the web based system, he can plan some web shell. And later he come back and check this web shell and do that system uh, remote command execution. In this case, we found on suspicious post command to some uh, unusual file like that index.2127.php. Uh, and if we check this, this is the some sort of pass and this. Look, this, this is the some sort of hash value. So then we collect this URL and go for the URL in the regular browser. We will found this type of thing that is one short and one there is a password field. That means this is that backdoor which if for this accessing this backdoor, the attacker or the user need to know the exact URL and exact file and that password. And if we just simply click the view source, then we found that it will input uh, some uh, password and then allow to user to go access the shell. Now we go for uh, some uh, suspicious post request. This is that example of uh, last uh, three example was uh, given from the server system side and most of the taking the web system. And this is the example of the LAN system that from the up, if uh, some user uh, uh, compromise, one of the compromise system indication is that uh, that particular PC do some remote communication and put information to remote system. And for putting information to system attacker mostly use that HTTP post most of the time. And uh, this is the example of like this, that is uh, some user actually post some value to some website and this is that same, uh, what is he put from his PC and server responses is 200, okay. But if we look the chair carefully, check this uh, PK file, here we found the Chrome extension and there is something is there. And if we check from various IOC department with this, will found this is that Chromium extension for the hijacking browser. And that this website where you put his uh, uh, the data, the, the server, uh, the system or the domain is already known as a malicious to common uh, uh, security domain. So this is the example of that user sometime for, uh, for various cases, they use some extension in his Chrome extension or something other extension, something is, this is the typical example of that uh, uh, legit uh, Chrome extension working some sort of uh, malicious activity. 
Now this is that uh, another uh, example of if from the LAN, which you're taking from the LAN. Uh, another thing is that if uh, some uh, user is compromised in the LAN side, his or her PCs or computer usually time to time query to various CNC system. For you checking this domain query, we can identify which type of uh, computer system is uh, already compromised because this is unusual domain and listed as a malware domain. The normal PC is a normal user will not query type this type of domain. This is the another method that uh, you checking the domain query, we can identify the malicious domain, uh, network traffic. <clears throat> this is that uh, defense. This is the case of the defacement from the hacky beast activity. So if we found that, uh, that there is some gotcha.php and we found that event and found that uh, some intruder uploaded some file name is gotcha.txt and rename it to the PHP file and uh, taking the screenshot and uh, published in Twitter, Handle Media or Pastebin for hacky beast activity. So uh, by uh, capturing this type of tra uh, traffic, we can also identify the root cause because previous event of this traffic, we can found that there is a post file manager exe action dot delete. If we uh, check this URL to some uh, uh, common uh, exploit provider, for example, exploit db dot uh, home, we found this is the um, similarity of this file and this file. So from analysis, then we can also find out the possible causes. Now there is some interesting two cases on the case study seven and case studies uh, eight. Actually, uh, there is some common thing. One is that hacky piece do hacktivity and it change defacement do. And, <clears throat> and the, uh, this is that a common thread of the light of a, a APT, that means that he planned, but he didn't, uh, attacker planned, but attacker didn't uh, put uh, some sort of uh, uh, malware uh, file or like that. Rather than it will actually, uh, he tried this machine to work from him and try to working as a zombie. For example, the server system is compromised and then we identified the server unusually queries some sort of shell script to some uh, IPs and the shell script, after getting the shell script, <clears throat> the remote server response is okay. What is the content of the shell script? Just check. The content of the shell script, it is the shell script. First of all, it will check <clears throat> if this is file is already armed, then it will be exciting because the attacker is not interested to plant his uh, uh, bot to if there is arm uh, arm based processor system that means he need more computing power then he actually go that cd.tmt why temp because temp usually global uh, permission is actually permission is 777 then actually it will scroll some sort of shell from the other what is that and the result output is that like this dota dota dot dj after this he will go to this file cd.arm and he planned his mail script to Linux legitimate RNYNC Rhine's script, which is actually uh, Unix and Linux based. Uh, <clears throat> he actually disguised his process to legitimate thing. The this is that, uh, yes. You have two more minutes left. Oh, okay. As a heads up. Actually, uh, sorry, uh, actually, this is the example of lateral movement that how that uh, exact attacker will uh, go for the lateral movement. And this is another example of the IOC uh, sevens. Uh, this is the example of the King Sync bot activity. Actually, it bought, uh, it take it server, if service is compromised, it uh, taking the input and hit, he tried to ebat his system and kill the kill chain and kill the IP sync, uh, IP tables. Uh, for make that uh, system is uh, hiding and he attacked to <clears throat> other system to checking that best history command and try to make this system is a zombie to attack to other system. Uh, uh, like this, this is that already red mark is blue. Uh, I think, uh, 
I think I'm open for the question. Already All right. Finished. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting uh, presentation, especially, you know, you're sharing a lot of live data sets from real cases and incidents. So there's a lot to learn there, uh, especially those who are interested to learn more about how attacks works and so on and so forth. Uh, we seem to not have any question at the moment, but uh, if anybody have any question or have any feedback, you can reach out uh, directly to the Bashis. Um, his email is in the presentation. And by the way, the presentation can be downloaded from the conference uh, website. Uh, the Bashis, thank you very much for sharing with us today. Uh, and I certainly have learned a lot from, uh, from your presentation. So from uh, Dhaka, we will be going to a city in India called Beljaum. I hope I'm, mentioned, I'm, I'm saying this correctly. Belgaum. Belgaum, sorry. <laughs> Belgaum, thank you, Sunny. Belgaum. Uh, and uh, this is where our next speaker is based in. Uh, and this is uh, no stranger to APNIC and the APNIC community. Um, the next speaker is Mr. Swapnil Patnekar. Uh, and he will be talking about uh, passive DNS. The title of his presentation is Uncovering Badness with Passive DNS. So without further ado, I would like to invite Swapnil to share his presentation. Thank you, Adli, for the introduction. Uh, can you see my screen and am I audible? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Let me make this full screen. So hello everyone. Um, so I will be talking about uh, threat hunting using passive DNS. And uh, so I'll be covering the basics of passive DNS as well as um, who benefits using passive DNS, as well as sharing a couple of uh, recent examples uh, or my experiences more specifically of using passive DNS. And hopefully I can take uh, a lot of questions at the, at the very end. Uh, so what is passive DNS? Uh, so Florian Weimar uh, presented a paper on passive DNS replication at uh, first uh, the 17th first conference, uh, security conference in 2005. So I won't be going into detail uh, into the paper, but I highly recommend that you uh, check that paper out. The, the idea is, is very simple, is to record cache miss DNS queries as seen in a recursive resolver and store it in a, in a database for later reference. And uh, the database can also be queried using something like a REST API. So here is a simple uh, network uh, representation which has a recursive resolver, on-premise recursive resolver. And in the context of passive DNS, uh, the, the, the recording part of uh, the queries or the recording of the DNS transactions is done by something called as a passive DNS sensor software, which, is, which gets installed in the in the same machine which is running the recursive resolver. So in this, in this specific example, the domain name r2-d2.info, the DNS A record, which is uh, you know, the cache miss uh, traffic would get stored in the passive DNS database. By the way, if you're a Star Wars fan, um, I would uh, highly urge you to look at the domain names in this slide. Uh, too bad, I've already registered them and I use them as spam traps and uh, SDINet.info is also my way of uh, paying gratitude to Clifford Stone. So why passive DNS? Uh, everything uh, on the internet uh, begins with a DNS query. So internet is, is used for legitimate purposes and also abused by the bad actors. For example, uh, targeted phishing domains, ransomware uh, domains used in ransomware or you know, domains also used in botnets. And domain names, domain names are also cheap. Uh, you know, you can buy a domain name for, you know, in, in India for dot .in, you could probably buy a domain name for maybe a few hundred rupees. And uh, a recent study uh, also outlined that majority of the domain names that are registered are also used for malicious purposes. So if we are investigating a suspicious domain name, doing a forward lookup poses um, uh, some sort of a risk as well as uh, if it's a targeted domain, then for a specific geography, then it may not yield the results that we are looking for. 
because it would resolve differently depending on how the attackers would have would have configured the name servers. The other thing what uh, forward lookups, uh, forward DNS lookups do not provide is the is the information about mapping of which other domains are primarily using the same uh, IP address, the DNS A record per se, or which other domains are using the same set of authoritative name servers, or what other, uh, you know, which other domains are using the same MX uh, record for that matter. So this is where passive DNS is uh, extremely useful uh, because passive DNS provides um, an, an, an understanding of mapping the interconnections. So ideally in this case, uh, using passive DNS, what we could do is we could take a, take a domain name or an IP address, just like the IP address, what you see on this specific slide. And we could do a reverse search to uh, find which other domains or which other uh, you know uh, you know host names are using the same IP address or which other domains are using the same name service. So this mapping is something which answers questions which probably I outlined in the previous slide as well, like you know the mapping of what other entities or what other domain uh, names specifically are using the same infrastructure. So who should be using passive DNS? Um, in my opinion, anyone who's working on security uh, uh, is, is, will find passive DNS extremely useful. Um, so this encomp encompasses everyone for that matter. And more specifically, people working on DNS abuse um, who are looking at you know, suspicious domain names, phishing, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. So I've outlined uh, a few of the passive DNS operators here. And uh, most of the uh, passive DNS operators provide uh, a free account with uh, some sort of limitation for number of queries per day, uh, as well as per month. And uh, these, the, all of the passive DNS operators provide a RESTful uh, API, which you know typically you can use, you know, and do a lot of automation as well. So for this specific uh, presentation, I'm using the Spamhouse technology uh, passive DNS uh, API or database more specifically. So I'm going to talk about now, you know, a couple of uh, recent examples or experiences of how I have used uh, passive DNS uh, to uncover badness. So uh, in the last couple of years, more specifically in the last one year, uh, there have been a lot of uh, incidents as well as reports of uh, domain hijacking of large number of domains um, and uh, or domain shadowing as it, as it is also called as referred to as. And uh, in this context, uh, in this specific presentation, I will be uh, demonstrating GoDaddy, uh, uh, this, this specific attack, domain shadowing attack at GoDaddy. But that doesn't mean that this, this is happening only with uh, the domain name registrar GoDaddy. This is also happening with other registrars as well. Um, and also not my intention to uh, just highlight GoDaddy per se, but it's one of the largest domain name registrars. And that is uh, the reason that you know, I will be focusing on, on, on this. So there are links for uh, with regards to uh, you know the reports. So you could you could look into that. So what is a domain shadowing attack? Uh, so attackers basically gain um, you know control of uh, the access credentials of a domain name and create a, a DNS record or a subdomain, which uh, which is pointing to their hosting infrastructure, and and that primarily uh, is is something which is having phishing content or malware or you know, something which is malicious. So uh, in the context of GoDaddy uh, domain shadowing, the attack goes something like this. Um, after the attackers have gained access or control of the domain names, uh, they create uh, something like a DNS uh, A record or a subdomain record, txi.domain.tld, where domain.tld is the, is the affected domain. And it's a CNAME record, which is pointing to voxpk.duckdns.org. And voxpk.duckdns.org is pointing to an IP address uh, and uh, it, it's in a specific AS. So here is, a, uh, here is one of the affected domains. Uh, income tax notice.in is one of the affected domains under the .in uh, country code uh, TLD. And as you can see in the WHOIS output here, you can see that uh, the domain is registered with GoDaddy. This is the output from uh, the passive DNS, uh, Spamhouse passive DNS database. Uh, it's basically JSON. And you can see a number of records here. 
So this is, uh, you know, each is a record which is highlighting all the uh, all the DNS uh, transactions or the, all the DNS, you know, uh, records that the passive DNS database has with regards to the data with regards to the domain name income tax dot in. So you can see that there is a there is an A record. So if you look at the RR type, you can see that it's an A record at the very top. Uh, then you have the NS records, which is the name servers, the authoritative name servers. And then thirdly, what you have is the CNAME record for voxpk.tuckdns.org, which is pointing to that. That is pxi.incometax.in is pointing uh, to voxpk.tuckdns.org. Here is a forward lookup just to give you uh, uh, give you an understanding uh, uh, for that matter. So when I do a dig on the command line at the terminal, I can see that uh, you know the same uh, thing which is present in the passive DNS database as well. So let me go ahead and uh, show you a quick demo, and hopefully the the demo gods are with me. So what you're seeing here is basically the uh, the API. So uh, just to backtrack a bit, all the passive DNS operators provide a web interface which you can use to search uh, in, inside the database. But I'm, I'm, I prefer the command line. So I'm using the API on in, inside the terminal using curl. And once you have the authentication which is stored inside the API variable, I'm able to search for uh, the domain name voxpk.duckdns.org. And if you see the, the, the parameter in the URL, you can see that I'm looking for, uh, find out, give me answers for the A record pertaining to uh, the domain voxpk.duckdns.org. And uh, the, apart from uh, a record, we could also specify other records as well, which I will probably show in a couple of more uh, examples as well. So you can see that uh, this outlines uh, the, uh, the various records which are present. And you can see that we are able to see that there are multiple records for the same domain, uh, which is voxpk.dugdns.org, which tells us that this is pointing to, you know, has been pointing to different IP addresses uh, for that matter, because passive DNS is a historical database. It's, it's not uh, what it is pointing to right now, but what the database seen, has seen at a certain point of time. And what we can also do is we can take the time uh, underscore last parameter. So it's, it's an epoch and we could convert it. To, so as, as an example, what I'm doing is I have a small little script called as H time. And what H time basically does is it converts epoch uh, time to something which is human readable for the, for the presentation for that matter. And what we can also do is we can also use the API to now uh, you know, pose a question to the database saying that, hey, what about, what if I want to know all the domains which have the C name pointing to voxpk.dugdns.org. And we could do that by saying uh, C name and uh, changing the RR set to R data. So R data here means in the, in the context of the API, R data means we want to do a reverse search. That is from the C name, we want to find all the, all the records matching, um, matching the, uh, the specific uh, domain name or query name that we are looking for. And we can see that the passive DNS database has a number of, uh, you know, uh, domains which are affected here with, with, with regards to the code ID hijacking. So here is an example. Uh, I would highly, uh, you know, recommend that you do not access these URLs in the browser unless and until you are doing so in a contained environment. But just for example, of course, I've done this in a, in a more specifically in a contained environment, but you can see that this is one of the affected domains and it has a, you know, a suspicious looking script. Here is one more example, which again, probably is, is very suspicious from the look of it. And here is a, a, a phishing URL, which is, uh, which is impersonating DHL for that matter. Uh, another example that I, I'd like to explore using passive DNS is, is uh, this uh, domain name netbanksecure.app. And uh, this is impersonating the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So when I when we when I look into the passive DNS database, I can see that uh, I'm able to find for the the domain netbanksecure.app uh, that the the number of records. So there is there is the NS record. So the the domain is is the authoritative name servers are with Google, as well as so the, there are the four name server records for the domain. 
But then what I can also do is I can take the IP address, uh, which is which the domain is pointing to or was pointing to in the passive DNS database. And I can do a reverse search, which uh, in the passive DNS database and find out all the other domains which are pointing to the same uh, to the same uh, IP address. And you can see that this kind of uncovers a whole, uh, you know, a whole lot of uh, badness. So you can see all of these domains are primarily uh, domains registered, targeted for phishing, impersonating the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Here is uh, one more example of uh, using passive DNS. So this is a very suspicious looking. So I, I look at threat intelligence uh, feeds of a number of providers. And this was one of a very, you know, one of the entries uh, which I found last night, uh, very suspicious. So by the way, if you're looking at the slides, the slides might not have the updated content, uh, primarily because I wanted to have, you know, latest data rather than just screenshots for that matter. So there are a couple of things which I've changed and I'll probably upload it once again, once I'm done with it. So you can probably download it again, or you can reach out to me on, 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 the, on the contact channels. So this is a suspicious looking domain and I'm doing a DNS lookup and I can see that it is pointing to one specific IP address and there are these two name servers uh, uh, which are authoritative for it. So let's look into uh, using uh, passive DNS, what we can find here. So what we are looking for is, uh, we are looking for uh, more specifically, which other domains are using the same name servers. So we are specifying that the uh, in the database find all entries which are having the name servers so and so, and um, you know we can find you know a lot of examples and you know most of these examples are very shoddy domains, very suspicious looking domains, and uh, probably created for some some sort of malicious uh, purposes. I, I hope this gives uh, you the idea. So I, I'm going to make sure that I'm. I'm well inside time, so I can take a few questions. So probably I will um, expedite a bit. So here is a, a friend of mine, Chris, uh, shared on Twitter uh, and, and uh, details of an SMS that he has he had received, uh, which contained a link to, uh, you know, which contained a phishing uh, URL impersonating PayPal. And when I looked into uh, the passive DNS database uh, for the IP address that it was pointing to, and doing a reverse search. If you see the screenshot in the middle of the slide, uh, there were hundreds and you know thousands of uh, domains which cannot even fit in this specific uh, you know image or in this slide more specifically. So you can go to the specific source, you'll find a, a whole lot of uh, badness, whole lot of shoddiness with respect to how attackers are primarily using domains for that matter. Speaking of PayPal, uh, you could also do something like a word match in the in the passive DNS database and search for all domains or, or, or all host names which are having the word PayPal in it, right? And that's super useful if you are, um, you know, protecting your brand assets with respect to domains, or if you're a bank, you know, you want to, you want to make sure that nobody's impersonating your domain. So you could use something like uh, a word match in the passive DNS, and you can see there are, there are a lot of suspicious domains in here. So I'm going to go to the next one so I can take a few questions. So uh, the hope uh, with, with the presentation I've given uh, uh, you know, today, I hope that uh, it has given you an idea of how passive DNS can uncover badness and it also allows you to map the interconnections. So one thing to note is passive DNS uh, is a historical database. So not every operator may not have a full picture. So you might come into uh, cases where in a passive DNS database, you might not find an answer. So. That's, and, and the last one is there is, uh, there is work being done with regards to standardizing the output format. So uh, there is a link for that. You can check that out. With that, I would like to hand over back to Adli and thank you so much. I would love to have take any questions if I can. Sounds good. Thank you, Swapnil, for the very interesting presentation. We do have one question. Maybe you can address this quickly. How sure. much, uh, the question is from Anthony. How much DNS traffic is required to provide a useful passive DNS database? Is this something that an admin at a campus or office network can set up? Or can, only, can this only be done by large network ISP operators? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the visibility or uh, access to multiple sensors could 
you know, kind of enhance the database because that would give more, uh, you know, weightage or more uh, understanding to what is happening in the DNS ecosystem. So just having a small number of sensors, I do not think it, it gives a, it gives a broader impact, especially if you're looking at investigating domain names, you know, registered from anywhere or any part of the world. So uh, the advantage what the passive DNS operators have is they have a very large sensor network. So they have networks in, in, in a lot of places and they have a very uh, you know, uh, detailed vantage point uh, look into what is happening in the DNS ecosystem. So one a project what I can suggest that you can, you can look into uh, exploring is if I'm not uh, getting it incorrect, I think the project is D4. Uh, it's an open source project which allows you to run a passive DNS uh, sensor uh, for that matter. You could also look at something called as DNS tap, which allows you to, you know, um, collect uh, DNS transactions because logging is, is just not, uh, it's, it's, it's a bottleneck. So DNS tap is probably what you could explore, but you'll have to put all the pieces together. I hope uh, I have been able to answer that question. All right. Sounds good. Um, of course, everybody can reach out to Swapnil uh, if you have more questions. There's also a question from Jahangir, but I, we are not able to take that up at the moment please reach out to Swapnil for more uh, information. Now we have reached at the end of our first, APNIC first session. Sounds very complicated, but, uh, but don't, don't go away. Uh, we still have more coming, uh, three more presentations on very interesting topics. We're just gonna take a 15 minute break, but before we go for a break, I would like to do a quick shout out to some uh, participants from Las Vegas, Philippines, Bhutan, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, a few other places that was uh, mentioned there. Uh, there is a, a session poll uh, for a quick evaluation. If you could do that, uh, uh, we would highly uh, appreciate it. Uh, and uh, of course, we do have the conference social uh, session that you can, uh, or uh, platform that you can join in uh, as well uh, during the break. So let's take a 15 minute break, more or less. Uh, you know, stretch, stretch those legs or uh, hands, uh, make some coffee or tea, and I will see you back at, uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody. See you soon.